Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Marty Rabinovich. I am a partner at uh, Devery Smith Frank and uh, the head of the employment law group at the firm. Uh, for lawyers who are watching and for human resources professionals who are watching this program, uh, the program has been approved for one hour and 45 minutes uh, for HRPA hours and uh, one hour and 45 minutes of substantive CPD hours uh, with the Law Society of Ontario uh, for lawyers. Uh, so uh, for, for those of you who have attended our seminars before, welcome back. And uh, for those of you who maybe have not been to any of our seminars before, uh, we hope that you enjoy today's presentation and that you continue to attend our firm's seminars. We will be addressing four topics today. Uh, the first is about COVID-19, a legislative update and some tips to ensure a safe workplace. We will then get into the uh, enforceability of termination clauses, a topic that just uh, keeps on coming up uh, no matter uh, how far along we get. So we'll look at two decisions here, one's called Waxdale and one's called Sewell. We will then look at the employee's entitlement to bonus and stock awards, which vest throughout the reasonable notice period. And finally, we will end with a presentation on whether an employer is obligated to continue benefit plan contributions to an employee who is off work due to a disability. Okay, so here is uh, an overview of today's agenda. So uh, there are there are four presentation topics, as we said. Uh, there are 20 minutes allocated to each topic. I will tell you right now, the COVID-19 topic is a little bit longer than the others. Um, so it'll be a little bit more than 20 minutes for that one, but uh, the others will be shorter and we will get through everything uh, on time. Uh, we will take a break at about uh, 10.25 for 15 minutes. And then uh, at the break, uh, this will be a good opportunity for you to submit any questions that you may have. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to submit your questions through GoToWebinar. And then I will review all of the questions at the break and uh, I will come back at about 2211 to answer all the questions. Now, one of the frequently asked questions that, uh, that we've gotten for the last few seminars is whether or not the slides will be available. So I will answer that one right now. Um, the answer is absolutely yes, the slides will be available. Um, they will be available Shortly after the presentation, uh, they will be uh, they will be saved to our firm's website. Or if you would like, uh, you can contact me, and I would be happy to email you a copy of the slides. Okay. So let's move forward here. And uh, sorry for any technical difficulties that we're we're having here with the slides, but. Uh, here we go. So let, let's get right into the COVID-19 topic. So this is the legislative update and tips to ensure a safe workplace. OK, so here is an overview of this topic. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, every single point on this slide, um, but this is what the presentation will cover today. OK, so. You all know by now what uh, what COVID-19 is. Uh, it's uh, It's been around uh, since the beginning of the year. I'm not gonna go through uh, every single point on this slide either. And on that note, uh, the slides are of course intended uh, to help with this presentation, but they are also intended to be a resource uh, that you can hang on to after the pre presentation and refer to as need be 
and there is no vaccine or treatment for COVID-19 as of yet. However, we did get some very good news recently. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the FDA in the United States uh, estimated relatively recently that a vaccine may be available in the spring of 2021. And then we got some very, very good news uh, yesterday related to the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine trials and, and their early data indicates uh, that the, the vaccine is more than 90% effective. So that, uh, that bodes very, very well uh, for a vaccine. And uh, hopefully um, if, uh, if, if, that, if those tests work out, hopefully we'll be able to get a vaccine out there uh, by next year. Uh, the, we, we've learned a lot about the coronavirus symptoms over uh, throughout 2020. And uh, I've grouped them here into, into two. So the main, what I'll call the main symptoms of, of COVID-19, you've got uh, a fever, cough, shortness of breath, and loss of taste or smell. Uh, so those are, are sort of the, what I'll call the main symptoms. And then there's a whole bunch of other symptoms that uh, the medical community has identified as well. Uh, that are associated with COVID-19. So we're talking here like a sore throat and painful swallowing, stuffy and runny nose, headache, um, and so on. Okay, and that will be important once we look at some of the specific employer guidance for COVID-19 later on. Uh, how to prevent transmission and spread? Well, we, we all know some of this, uh, physical distancing, um, wearing masks, um, certainly, uh, I'd recommend a mandatory masking policy in your workplace, more on that later. Um, and I'll also just highlight here uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, decision guide for workplaces. Uh, this is a link to the City of, of Toronto's uh, webpage, which contains this decision guide. So this, this is essentially screening for employees to determine whether or not um, someone should be permitted to come to work at all. And we will, we will get into this a little bit later in the presentation. This slide is a quick overview of, uh, of the timeline of, of COVID-19 business closures in Ontario. So it's intended as a bit of a recap and an overview. Uh, so in March of 2020 uh, was when the, the full lockdown happened. Um, so only essential businesses were permitted to remain open. Um, and then in April 2020, the government announced a gradual reopening plan, which was to occur in stages. Uh, so then May, we get stage one, June in uh, stage two, July stage three in the province of Ontario. Um, in October, unfortunately, uh, the cases started to spike again. So there were some regional rollbacks uh, to a modified stage two. And then very recently, just earlier this month in November, uh, the government introduced a new system, which is essentially color-coded risk categories uh, for each health unit in the province. And we will, we will get into to that in a bit more detail later on. So let's look at the, uh, the reopening uh, of Ontario as of September. Um, so by then, uh, pretty much all of Ontario had entered stage three, schools were open, uh, concerts and sporting events with, with spectators remained restrictions. Uh, the government continued and continues to encourage working from home as much as possible. Uh, the mandatory uh, face covering bylaws uh, remained in place in many municipalities, including Toronto. However, this is something we'll talk about in a bit more detail later, but I would just note that uh, in accordance with uh, the regulations to the Reopening Ontario Act, uh, there actually were more strict mask requirements that were introduced, and we'll take a look at that shortly. And the restrictions that we're seeing are likely to stay in place until either the pandemic ends or until a vaccine or an effective treatment for COVID-19 is available. So in stage three, most workplaces and businesses were permitted to open, uh, including dining restaurants and bars, and gatherings of up to 50 people were permitted indoors and up to 100 people were permitted outdoors. 
when we had the regional rollbacks to the modified stage two, uh, the gathering limits were reduced again. So 10 people indoors and 25 people outdoors. All sorts of indoor services uh, were required to close, food and drink services, gyms, movie theaters and whatnot. And then personal care services for which face coverings had to be removed uh, were also prohibited. And then in November, we get to uh, the color coded safety risk categories. Okay, so there are five categories that the that the provincial government established and it goes all the way from green, which is what we'll, we'll call here standard measures. And then it goes all the way to gray, which they're calling maximum measures. Okay. And what happens is the regions are classified based on multiple criteria, such as the COVID-19 incidence rate per 100,000 people, um, the test positivity rate, uh, hospital and uh, ICU capacity, and the ability of public health units to contact trace. And when it comes to Toronto, uh, the current restrictions on Toronto are in place until November 14th. So in other words, the modified stage two, um, at which point uh, no, on November 14th, the, uh, the new color coded system is going to apply. And then Toronto will likely be placed in the orange category at that time. So here is a, a visual representation um, of everything. So um, essentially when we're looking at uh, the, uh, the green zone on the left, the focus is on education and awareness. Okay, so you're essentially just trying to prevent. And then all the way on the right here, the gray zone um, is if there's a lockdown necessary. Now, luckily uh, there are no regions currently in the lockdown phase right now. Okay, so the Occupational Health and Safety Act imposes on employers an obligation to maintain a safe working environment. And employers have an obligation to show that they acted reasonably to protect the health and safety of employees, including exposure to COVID-19. So let's have a look at some of the regulations now that were enacted under the Reopening Ontario Act, uh, which, uh, which took effect in October of 2020. Okay, so section 2.1 of these two regulations makes it very clear that employers must comply with the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So if, you, if you're responsible for a business or organization, and that business is open, you must comply with the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And then the regulation also goes on to say that businesses must comply with advice, recommendations, and instructions of public health officials. And then it goes even further and gets more specific and says that businesses must comply with the advice, recommendations, and instructions issued by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health with respect to screening individuals. Okay, so what does that all mean? So on September 25th, the Ministry of Health released a COVID-19 screening tool for workplaces. And uh, there's a link to this tool right here. So you can have a look at that um, at some point. Okay, now this is what the screening tool says. It says that screening should occur before or when a worker enters the workplace at the beginning of their shift or when an essential visitor arrives. And at minimum, the following questions should be used to screen individuals before they are permitted entry into the workplace. Okay, so the questions are whether the person has any of the following new or worsening symptoms or signs, and the symptoms, uh, we'll show a visual shortly, uh, but the symptoms that we're talking about here are the same symptoms as the ones that you saw on the earlier slide. The second question is whether or not the person has traveled outside of Canada in the past 14 days. 
And third, whether the person has had close contact with a confirmed or probable case of COVID-19. And essentially, if the person answers yes to any of these questions, then they have not passed the test and they should not enter the workplace. So as a best practice for employers, I would suggest that employers have the employees answer the questions on a daily basis, and they should submit their responses to, an ele to, to the employer electronically. So that can be done in an email, it can be done through an online form, um, and that way the employer can keep a record of the responses from the employees to demonstrate that the employer has complied with its obligations to screen employees. Okay, some additional documents here. The first one is the Toronto Public Health Guidance for Employers on Preventing COVID in the Workplace is a good resource to look at and arguably is a recommendation as defined in the, the regulations that we saw. And then we'll also look at here the COVID-19 decision guide for workplaces, okay? And the link for that is here as well. But we've also put this on the next two slides here, okay? So the first slide is uh, the daily screening, okay? So these are symptoms that uh, employees should be looking for, okay? So uh, it's the same symptoms again as we saw on the earlier slide. Uh, there's some nice visuals now uh, to help. And then the second part of the document uh, explains or explains what, what to do uh, in the case of certain responses. So if you have had no close contact with the person who has COVID-19 symptoms, um, you don't have symptoms, you, are, you have not been tested or are waiting for a test result, or if you've tested negative, then you have passed the screening and you can go to work, okay? However, in all of the other scenarios that we see here, um, the individual will, will not have passed the test, right? So for example, if the person has had close contact with someone with COVID-19 um, or, um, or for example, uh, has had close contact and does have symptoms, for example, um, all of the, the, the recommendations are included in the document. Essentially, in, in the vast majority of the cases, uh, the employee uh, should not be going to work and should be staying home, okay? So now let's look at uh, the tips and, uh, and tips and considerations for businesses. Um, many of these have remained the same uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, first of all, determine whether or not it's really necessary for staff to be physically in the office. Um, many, many employees, I would say, have been very, very productive while working from home during the pandemic. Not all jobs, of course, can be done from home, but uh, many of them can. So that's the first thing for employers to consider. Uh, we talked about screening employees um, using these uh, decision guides that we looked at. Um, have a plan. So if an employee contracts COVID-19, what are you going to do as an employer? Well, you'll need to communicate with your employees. Uh, you'll probably need to clean the area. You may need to close your office temporarily, depending on the nature of your business and the size. And you should also be obtaining and following advice from your local public health unit. Okay, any employees who may be at high risk of catching the virus, um, should be identified and the employer, if not already done, should come up with an individually tailored plan uh, for those individuals. And uh, another good one is to consider staggered or work schedules so as to minimize the amount of employees who are in your building at any one time. Um, some additional recommendations here and um, physical distancing signage can help. Uh, there is some good guidance for cleaning and disinfecting public areas, uh, which can be found on the Public Health Ontario website. Um, I'll just highlight this one here about uh, better air quality and circulation, um, in particular because we have rising numbers in Ontario and we are approaching winter. Uh, some would say it's already winter. Um, it, it's very important to ensure good airflow. Um, so in addition to, to having a mandatory mask policy, 
um, employers should do what they can to, to figure out how good their air circulation or airflow system is in their in their building and uh, take steps to uh, to upgrade it uh, to ensure the best possible airflow. And then again on masking, I, I would strongly recommend making masks mandatory throughout the entire workplace. So on the topic of, of masks, so here are again the two regulations uh, which were enacted under the uh, Reopening Ontario Act. Okay, and th these th this section right here um, is what the, the statute says about masking. So essentially, if you are responsible for a business and you are open, it's your responsibility to ensure that any person in the indoor area of the premises of the business or organization wears a mask when they are inside unless so these are now the exceptions unless the person so performs work for business for the business or, or the organization so it has to be um, an employee basically and um, they have to be in an area that is not accessible to the public so they could be i guess presumably in their office or or in the, in the hallways or somewhere in the buildings that's not accessible to the public um, and they have to be able to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from every other person while in the indoor area okay so this this section actually imposes a more strict or onerous requirement on employers than the Toronto Municipal Bylaw does that we saw earlier. Um, so to keep things simple, at this stage in the COVID-19 game, it's probably easiest just to require uh, anyone, visitor, visitors, employees who are going to be in your building to wear a, a mask at all times, okay? And uh, the exception is going to have to be only at times when, when you as an employer can be very, very sure uh, that physical distancing can be maintained. So for example, if you are at a workplace uh, which, which has offices, uh, you, could, you could say that uh, if the employees are sitting at their desk in their office, then they would be able to, to take their mask off. And, and that way they would be able, able to eat too, for example, uh, without coming too close to others, okay? Some additional tips here as well. Um, it's going to depend on the workplace as well. And um, some of these things I'm sure many of you as employers have already done. Um, hand sanitizer being available is a good one. Um, plexiglass barriers where, where um, appropriate. Um, signage uh, to remind staff and visitors of the importance of hand washing, for example, uh, closing unnecessary common areas are all good tips to consider for your workplace. Um, contact tracing, requiring uh, contact information for all visitors and all interactions where applicable, implement an order and wait outside policy, and try and use uh, uh, implement appointments and bookings in advance beforehand. Let's now look at a case called uh, United Steel Workers and Algoma Steel. This was a case that was decided in 2020 in the uh, in the COVID-19 era. Okay, and it was uh, an arbitration decision. So this case reminds us that employers have obligations to ensure that their COVID-19 policies do not have a discriminatory impact on their employees. So in this case, we had a worker who lived, who lived in the United States and worked in Canada, okay? And the worker had partial custody of his two young children in the United States, okay? Under Canada's Quarantine Act, everyone entering Canada had to self-isolate for 14 days, although there was an exemption for people who crossed the border regularly. So under the Quarantine Act, in fact, this employee would have been exempt. But nevertheless, uh, the employer introduced a policy which required a 14-day quarantine period for all of its workers who crossed the border. 
So what this meant for this particular employee was that he had to choose between his custody arrangement and from working. So the employee ultimately chooses not to work. He chooses uh, his family and he argues discrimination based on family status. Okay, he also had some, some arguments to make under the uh, collective agreement as well in the unionized world, um, but we'll focus on the family status argument uh, for this presentation. The matter goes to arbitration and the, uh, the adjudicator finds that the application of this policy to the worker amounted to discrimination due to family status in contravention of the human rights code. And this was the case even though the arbitrator did not have an issue with the policy generally. And in arriving at uh, the decision, the arbitrator suggested that the employee could have been required uh, to undergo regular COVID-19 testing, uh, to be bound by more strict distancing measures in the workplace, as well as masking rules, and that he might have uh, had to, to promise to avoid any COVID-19 hotspots in the United States. So in other words, the arbitrator was saying, well, you know, perhaps there were less onerous ways that the employer could have achieved its health and safety obligations in this case. Now, also of note was that the arbitrator set out in the decision that the US location where the employee lived in fact had a relatively low rate of COVID-19 infections. So we know that a lot of these cases are fact driven. Uh, we do have to wonder a little bit uh, whether the outcome may have been different if the employee lived in uh, in a, in, in a different city in the United States, you know, like New York, for example, where there were lots of, of COVID-19 cases or one of the, the epicenters. Um, but in any event, um, that was not the case here. And uh, the ruling was in favor of the employee. So again, this case serves as a reminder uh, that the accommodation process, in particular in the COVID-19 world, can result in different accommodations and different solutions uh, for different employees. Uh, working remotely, um, so again, a reminder that the government does encourage employees to work from home or be permitted to work from home as much as possible um, during the pandemic. Um, and employees, I would say, have generally been more productive working from home than many would have expected. Okay, and uh, this has uh, been noted uh, in a number of uh, media articles and surveys, and I've set out a couple of them for you here if you are interested to read them. Refusing to work is going to continue to be an issue in the COVID-19 world, in particular as the numbers in Ontario climb. Employers, as we have seen, have a duty to provide a safe workplace. They need to take reasonable steps to prevent a COVID-19 outbreak. However, an employee cannot refuse to work because of a general fear of contracting the virus. They must point to something more specific. So if the employer just didn't have any social distancing policy, Maybe they have the policy, but in practice, they don't really enforce it very well or at all. You know, maybe, you know, an employer has absolutely refused to install plexiglass at a high traffic reception area. In those cases, then a work refusal may be justified. Okay. Um, but if not, uh, the work refusal may not be justified and the employee may be found to have abandoned their job. Okay, so employers in these sorts of situations should consider whether or not it's possible for uh, an accommodation to be implemented. If it's something such as installing plexiglass, then probably uh, that's a worthwhile thing to do. Employers, sorry, employees are not arbitrarily allowed to decline work, nor can they unilaterally decide where or when they will work, okay? Um, but if there is an employee who is saying that, you know, they have concerns or they don't want to work, um, before 
the employer immediately says that's enough come back to work or else there are a few considerations okay so first the employer should consider whether the employee is entitled um, to any sort of COVID-19 related leave of absence under the Employment Standards Act. Um, there are other leaves of absence set out in the Employment Standards Act that are not directly COVID-19 related, um, which could potentially apply to the situation. Um, employers should also consider whether the employee may be entitled to an accommodation pursuant to human rights legislation, and maybe that, accom maybe that accommodation would reasonably include the employee working from home. And then the employer should also consider whether, whether uh, their workplace is safe and whether you know, the employee is, is legitimately exercising their right to refuse unsafe work, okay? And as a best practice for employers, um, I, I would say just talk to the employee. If, they, if, if an employee keeps saying, I'm concerned, I'm, I'm very concerned, I, I, I can't get sick, and it's just not really clear to the employer what exactly the issue is. And um, if you have a conversation and with the employee and just say, you know, look, you know, this, these are all of the, the policies and procedures that we've implement, implemented having regard to COVID-19. Can you please explain to me what exactly you are concerned about? Often a resolution can be reached um, that way. Okay, and, and again, um, you know, the, the employer is entitled to take the position that an employee has abandoned their job if, uh, a, if a work refusal is not legitimate. And the employee could also lose their entitlement uh, to, to government benefits, such as the EI, the Canada Recovery Benefit, or, or any of the other ones. Okay. This is an interesting case on refusing to work. Um, it's called Kidane and Centro Dawn Inc. It's a uh, Labor Relations Board decision, which was decided in 1997, of course, long before the, the COVID-19 pandemic. But the issues in this case um, are arguably relevant to what's happening with the pandemic and some of these work refusals that we're seeing. So in this case, uh, the, the complainant was a counselor and uh, he said that uh, when she had when she was working with clients who did not have OHIP coverage it resulted in her having to address certain issues with them that stressed her out and that ultimately uh, were detrimental to her health okay she believed that the employer wasn't doing anything to address this so basically the employer said well sorry we're not going to tell you that you don't have to work with a client who doesn't have OHIP coverage so the employee refused to work and she brought a reprisal complaint under the occupational health and safety act and she argued that the employer had failed to take reasonable precautions to ensure a safe working environment and the Labor Relations Board uh, ultimately held that stress itself is not an excuse uh, to refuse work. And put differently, that stress is not a workplace hazard as contemplated by the Occupational Health and, and Safety Act. So is, COVID is there a COVID-19 hazard actually present if the employer takes all possible precautions? Um, I, I would say probably not. Okay, so although this case was decided uh, over 20 years ago, um, it's, uh, it, it arguably is helpful in addressing some of, some of the issues related to work refusals that have arisen in the, the COVID-19 context. Let's now look at some of the reporting obligations of employers. Uh, so under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, there is an obligation on the part of an employer to notify the Ministry of Labor um, if, uh, if the employer is advised that the worker has contracted an occupational illness. And uh, the definition of occupational illness is included here. Does this include COVID-19? I'm going to say probably yes, 
And then for WSIB employers, uh, there is also an obligation under Section 21 of the Act uh, to notify the WSIB um, if, they're, if the worker is involved in an accident which requires health care or results in the worker not being able to earn full wages. Okay, and the question is going to come up again as well, is this going to include contracted COVID-19 at work? And as a best practice to employers, I would say if an employee tells you that uh, they have COVID-19 and they, they tell you that they believe they contracted it in the workplace and, and there's some sort of credible explanation as to, to why that's the case, when in doubt, I would file the Form 7. So in other words, report it to WSIB. If the employee wants to proceed with the WSIB, claim they can and then the the WSIB will ultimately be the one to adjudicate uh, whether uh, whether there has in fact been a, a workplace injury essentially and and to what compensation if any uh, the employee would be entitled so some of the takeaways here so COVID-19 is continuing to change um, further restrictions are going to are absolutely possible, in particular if the numbers in Ontario continue to spike um, and the numbers worldwide continue to spike. We, we talked about um, you know, the positive developments for vaccines, um, which you know, will hopefully come to fruition in 2021, but uh, until then, you know, we, have to, we have to be mindful of the increasing numbers. If your business is open, and, and most businesses are these days, um, you will need uh, to ensure that policies are in place to comply with uh, requirements uh, pertaining to screening employees and maintaining safe work environments. Um, if you haven't already, uh, you should develop or amend working work at home policies and communicate those to employees. So one issue that we are likely to see is when you have employees who are working from home, and they have been now for some time because of the pandemic. When the pandemic is over and the employer says, okay, well, now I want you to come back to the office. And the employee says, well, but why? You know, I, I, I've been working from home for over a year and I'm doing my job very well. And, you know, you know, I don't have a written contract. So, I mean, you know, now it's, you know, an implied term of my contract that I'm allowed to work from home. You don't really want to be in that situation as an employer. Um, so that can be dealt with by, by introducing or amending your work at home policy, um, or also uh, including provisions about that in the employee's contract. Uh, the Algoma Steel case reminds us that um, employers have to, to make sure that their, their COVID-19 policies um, are not discriminatory and do not have a discriminatory impact on certain employees. And um, if an employee does contract COVID-19 at work, I would say, first of all, consult with a lawyer um, and consult with the appropriate health unit. Um, and then probably, uh, you know, based on what we talked about earlier in this presentation, there will likely be an obligation to report to the Ministry of Labor um, and or the WSIB if you are a WSIB employer. Work refusals, um, before you tell some tell an employee that they've abandoned their job, um, we would suggest consulting with a lawyer. And uh, before you do that, try and resolve those matters with the employees by talking to them. And then last but not least here, the daily COVID-19 screening of employees um, in the interest of both safety um but also compliance okay okay that concludes the presentation on COVID-19 and we are now going to move right into the presentation on termination clauses and the two cases that we will look at here are Waxdale and Swagen North America Inc and a second case that was decided more recently in 2020 called Sewell and Provincial Fruit Co. Limited.
Okay, so here is an overview of, of this presentation. Uh, we'll look briefly at uh, what termination clauses are, and then we will get into uh, the two cases. Okay. Okay, so what is a termination clause? So for, as a starting point, there are three relevant considerations when determining an employee's severance package entitlement. There's employment standards legislation, uh, the contract, and that's where the termination clauses come in, and uh, the common law. Um, I, I know that there may be uh, some of you with unionized workplaces who are listening uh, today. Um, and uh, of course, the, uh, the unionized world is a little bit uh, different when it comes, comes to termination. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, termination clauses set out an employee's entitlement upon termination. Uh, so for example, they will often address the employee's entitlement to pay in lieu of notice, severance pay, and benefit continuation. Most termination clauses are drafted in favor of the employer uh, to limit the employee's entitlement upon termination without cause. Courts will usually, well, courts will not enforce a termination clause which breaches the ESA by providing a lesser right or benefit to the employee or a termination clause that could potentially breach the ESA. And the common law reasonable notice is usually significantly greater than an employee's entitlements under the ESA. Okay, so why are termination clauses often struck down by the courts? So the purpose of employment standards legislation is to provide minimum entitlements and protections for employees. So employers and employees are not permitted to contract out of the ESA, and if the court finds the contract does not meet the minimum standard, the termination clause will be unenforceable. Okay, so if a termination clause provides or could provide for a lesser entitlement with respect to termination pay, severance pay, or benefit continuation, then the ESA would be unenforceable. So as an example, the ESA generally requires an employer to provide one week of, of notice for every completed year of service up to eight weeks but if there was a termination clause that said well yes you'll get your one week per year but it's capped at four weeks that is now going to be unenforceable because it potentially could infringe the esa if the employee is terminated after say three years it, it, it would be okay because the contractual entitlement and the ESA entitlement would be three weeks. But what if this employee works now for, for eight years? Okay, now the employee would not be getting their one week per year up to eight weeks under the ESA. So that clause would be unenforceable. Um, this slide sets out some of the policy considerations um, that have been considered by the courts. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, um, but essentially the courts have recognized that uh, work is very important to employees, and there there is a it is very important for employers to deal with employees fairly. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but the the Mappinger case is a good one uh, for you to read if you're not already familiar with it. Okay. The difference between the ESA and the common law. So as we've seen, the Employment Standards Act sets out minimum standards and it is not permissible to contract out of those standards. Uh, it's the common law though that will apply if a termination clause is ultimately found unenforceable. And the employee's entitlements under the common law are going to be significantly greater than under the ESA. Okay, so common law notice is generally capped at 24 months, whereas under the Employment Standards Act, notice is capped at eight weeks, statutory severance pay is capped at 26 weeks, but even so, eight weeks, way less than 24 months, 30, eight plus 26, so 34 weeks, also way less than 24 months. Okay, so this is why 
the difference between a statutory notice period and a common law notice period really matters. And I just wanted to highlight here, when we're looking at common law reasonable notice, the Bardell factors, the four factors at the bottom part of the slide here are what the court will consider, okay? There, there's no official rule, but generally speaking, if we, if we say the common law notice period is about a month per year as a starting point, but then it's gonna go up or down depending on how these factors play out, okay? Okay, so when we are dealing with termination for, or sorry, termination with cause, in order for the employee to be deprived of their ESA entitlement, so that's the termination pay and the statutory severance pay, the employee must engage in willful misconduct, disobedience, or willful neglect of duty. This is a very high standard. Okay, the common law standard for just cause has been accepted as a lower standard than willful misconduct. Okay, and there are some examples of, of misconduct on this slide that would result in just cause at common law. There is some overlap, but again, just keep in mind that the ESA standard, the willful misconduct standard, is a higher standard. So, in other words, it is harder for employers to prove that an employee's misconduct has risen to that level. So because there are two different standards, there could be scenarios in which an employee was terminated for just cause at common law and would be entitled to nothing, but had not engaged in willful misconduct as defined in the regulations to the Employment Standards Act. So in other words, there are scenarios in which an employee could have been terminated for just cause, but would still be entitled to their ESA minimums under Employment Standards Act, okay? So what the Waxdale decision concluded, and this is a 20, June 2020 decision of the Court of Appeal, the court held that in order for a termination scheme in a contract to be enforceable, all termination provisions must comply with the ESA, including both the termination with cause and without cause provisions. If part of the termination scheme is unenforceable, it is irrelevant whether there are separate and distinct termination provisions that would be enforceable on their own, an unenforceable termination for just cause language renders termination without cause language unenforceable, even if it otherwise would have been enforceable. And that was the real kicker with this case. And the, the above all applies even if the employee was terminated without cause. Now in Waxdale, uh, to be clear, the termination with cause was not actually set out in the Court of Appeal or trial decision. Uh, but as we've seen previously, the case did make it very clear uh, that the entire termination scheme has to be compliant with the ESA or otherwise the whole scheme will be unenforceable. Now in terms of what's next, um, you know, it, it's really hard to know because five, 10 years ago, I, I'm not sure that anyone really in the employment bar would have predicted uh, that a case like Waxdale would have come along. So the important part is we really just don't know what exactly is going to happen. Are we going to see arguments now from employees, lawyers that other unenforceable provisions in an employment contract, maybe the vacation provision or benefits provision or overtime provisions don't comply with the ESA? Are we gonna see arguments now that because of, of those unenforceable, unenforceable provisions that somehow that should affect the termination scheme? We just don't know, okay? So uh, all we can do is, is try and draft as, as carefully as possible. 
Uh, there is a little bit of good news uh, for employers out there and for the for the lawyers out here. This is just a copy of the of the Supreme Court of Canada's docket. And we'll, what we see here is that the employer in the Waxdale decision, so Swagen, has submitted their application for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. So in other words, uh, the employer has asked the Supreme Court of Canada uh, to, uh, to hear an appeal of the Court of Appeals decision. Okay, so let's have a look at, at what that actually means. Uh, so in order for the Supreme Court of Canada to hear a case, uh, you need permission. So a party has to ask for permission or, or call, otherwise called leave, and the court decides which cases it will hear. Typically, there's about 600 applications for leave each year, and leave is granted usually for about 80 cases. So the, the odds are not really that good. Uh, that the Supreme Court of Canada will hear any one case, okay? The Supreme Court of Canada's mandate is to deal with issues of law which are of public importance or of such a nature or significance as to warrant a decision by the court. And this is an excerpt from the Supreme Court of Canada's website. Um, in order for the Supreme Court of Canada to hear an appeal, uh, the, the issues need to transcend the interests of the immediate parties. Um, so, for example, um, if the issue is determining the legal meaning of a provision of a statute, and it's a, it's a case of public importance, which will have an impact on society as a whole, then the Supreme Court will hear the case. So there is actually a public importance test that is set out in Section 40 sub 1, of the Supreme Court of Canada Act. Uh, th this slide I'm gonna leave uh, for you to read later. This is a little bit of the history about how the courts have interpreted uh, the relevant factors uh, for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. Anyway, the Supreme Court of Canada does have discretion as to whether to grant leave or permission, again, to hear this appeal. Um, an error in law or the general merit is not going to be sufficient. And probably in this case, it's going to come down to whether the Supreme Court is convinced that uh, that there is a public interest or there is a public importance of the Supreme Court of Canada clearing up the law um, about termination clauses or whether, in fact, you know, Waxdale, the Waxdale decision uh, was correct or not. Since Waxdale, there has been another case called Sewell and Provincial Fruit Co. Limited. And this, and as we'll see, uh, this case essentially applied the reasoning in Waxdale. So Mr. Sewell was fired without cause after six months of employment. He received two weeks salary and benefits, and he accepted a new position four months after the termination. Uh, the termination language in the contract is on this slide. Uh, so there is a termination for just cause provision here, and we'll see why this one turns out to be a problem, but it, it essentially says that we can terminate, the employer can terminate for just cause without paying any further compensation to the employee, okay? In arriving at its decision, uh, the court identified a couple of violations. The first was uh, the fact that the clause combined notice and severance pay entitlements, which you can't do. Um, but more for the purpose of this presentation, the court found that the termination for just cause provision was illegal because it contracted around the ESA requirement to provide notice, except in cases where an employee engaged in willful misconduct. So again, this is a reminder that the just cause standard is lower than the ESA standard of willful misconduct. And that is exactly the problem that the court identified in Waxdale and that the Superior Court in Sewell has now applied. So this is exactly what the court said here with respect to uh, the termination for just cause language. Um, and this is the court says, well, look, based on the Court of Appeals reasoning in Waxdale, and um, it contracted around the ESA requirement to provide notice, uh, 
except in cases of willful misconduct. So uh, the termination clause, the termination scheme is unenforceable. That now includes the termination without cause provision. And now the employee is entitled to a notice period at common law. So what is the significance of Sewell? Well, Waxdale is here to stay, at least for now. And um, of course, if the Supreme Court weighs in differently, then uh, I will uh, do another employment seminar at some point, which will address that. But for now, Waxdale is here to stay um, and Sewell. Uh, these cases have likely rendered many termination schemes unenforceable. So this would be a good time to seek legal advice. Uh, I would generally recommend having your employment contracts reviewed annually. And another possibility to try and avoid having your termination clause thrown out is to consider offering employees an amount greater than the ESA, but less than the common law entitlement. So the just cause provision fix to address the issue in Waxdale and Sewell, and um, this is a, an example of a, a just cause provision which should address the problem uh, because it now mentions that, that the employee would be entitled uh, to their ESA entitlements in the event of termination with just cause. So this should fix the issue that was raised in Waxdale. And then this language is another option for termination without cause. And um, if you would like to, to offer your employees the minimum ESA plus a little bit more uh, to try and increase the chances that your termination clause will be found valid and enforceable. Okay, so we are now at our third topic. I, I know there was no break at this time built into the schedule. Um, it is a few minutes before 10 o'clock. Um, let's take a little bit of a break right now. I will resume with the last uh, two topics at 10.05. Okay, so we will take a very, very short break until then. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we will see you then.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, the next topic that we are going to look at is uh, contracting out of bonuses and stock awards during notice during the notice period for dismissals without cause. And we will look at two cases here. The first is called Battiston and Microsoft Canada Inc. And the second is uh, a Supreme Court of Canada case called Matthews and Ocean Nutrition Canada Limited. So here is an overview of, of this presentation. Okay, so let's talk a little about uh, the background for, for common law notice periods. So if an employee is terminated without just cause, then the employer is required to provide notice to that employee. And as we've seen earlier, the length of the notice period is going to depend on employment standards legislation, the employment contract and uh, the common law. And we get to the common law if there is either no termination language in the contract or there is, but it's not enforceable. Okay, and then we also have to consider the Employment Standards Act. Um, those no th that, that, that notice is going to be included in any common law notice period, but uh, the ESA is based on the length of employment. And as we've seen, it sets out the minimum amount of notice or minimum entitlements for employees. Just another quick review here of the, the Bartle factors, which the court considers when addressing the common law notice period or determining what the common law notice period should be. Okay, so, an employee is entitled to all compensation and benefits that would have been paid if the employee was still employed. So in other words, if an employee is terminated without cause and they're entitled to a common law notice period, they would be entitled to things like their, their salary, their benefits, uh, you know, their car allowances and, and that sort of thing. Okay. The common law entitlement will include any bonus that was part of the employee's compensation package subject to a bonus policy or employment contract. So employers and employees can contract out of the employee's right to compensation during the notice period. However, any clause purporting to do so must be clear and unambiguous. Okay, so there is a two step test to determine whether an employee is entitled to a bonus during the notice period. All right, the first part of the test is whether the bonus was an integral part of the employee's compensation. And the second is whether there is any language in the bonus plan or the incentive plan language that unambiguously removes entitlement throughout the notice period. And any harsh and oppressive terms must be drawn to the employee's attention or they will not be binding. And these principles were recently considered with respect to stock awards and long-term incentive plans. So let's get right into these cases. So Battiston. Mr. Battiston was employed by Microsoft for almost 23 years. And in 2013, he was promoted to business and operations manager, consulting and support, which was the position that he held at the time of termination. In addition to his base salary, Battiston received benefits, including merit increases, cash bonuses, and stock awards, which collectively accounted for about 30% of his income. The stock awards were received by the employee, so he was entitled to them, but then they vested at a later date. So received and then vested. In 2017, a new director of operations was appointed who had a strained relationship with Mr. Battiston, and he alleged that Mr. Battiston was underperforming. Mr. Battiston is terminated without cause in 2018, and his reasonable notice period at common law is determined to be 24 months. So he had a pretty good day at court. That's just about as good as it gets. And in arriving at that conclusion, the court noted that Mr. Battiston had unsuccessfully applied to 70 similar positions during the notice period. 
So the issue that the court had to decide was whether Mr. Battiston was entitled to his stock awards that had not vested prior to termination. So here is an excerpt from the stock award plan. And if you have a look at it, uh, you'll see that it was clearly the intention of the employer uh, for, for Mr. Battiston not to be entitled to these stock awards uh, because he had already been terminated. Okay, so the understanding was that once the employee was terminated, that was it. And anything that was unvested, he would just not be entitled to that. So the court says, yes, so first part of the test, we agree that the stock awards were an integral part of Battiston's compensation. But the court also finds, that this, and this, the court also finds that the stock award agreement unambiguously excluded Battiston's right uh, to vest his stock awards after he was terminated without cause. However, the court then goes on and says, well, but the termination provisions of the stock awards agreement were onerous and they were not drawn to Battiston's attention. So Mr. Battiston testified that he hadn't actually read the full agreement and that he was not aware of these provisions. And um, so as I understand it, um, you know, Microsoft, you know, being a, a high tech company, Mr. Battiston had to enroll in the uh, in the stock awards plan electronically and he had to agree to a form of, of click wrap contract so he essentially had to click 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 scroll down read it and then click a, a box or a button saying that he agreed okay but he testified that he didn't really read it okay the court says or concludes that microsoft did not specifically draw these provisions to battiston's attention and the court followed the Court of Appeal decision called Tilden rent a car and uh, Clendenning with respect to the, the legal impact of not drawing an onerous term to someone's attention. So as a result, uh, the stock awards agreement terms with respect to uh, this case were found to be unenforceable. And Mr. Battiston was indeed entitled to the stock awards that would have vested during the notice period. And the other case that was decided in 2020 uh, is Matthews and Ocean Nutrition Canada Limited. So Mr. Uh, Matthews was employed by Ocean Nutrition since 1997 as a chemist. A new chief operating officer was appointed in 2007 who had a strained relationship with Mr. Matthews. And the court found that he had acted dishonestly and in bad faith towards him. And there was evidence of a campaign to marginalize Matthews in the company. So in 2011, Matthews says, all right, that's enough. I'm out of here. He sues for constructive dismissal. And uh, the court agrees uh, that, uh, that Mr. Matthews was constructively dismissed as a result of uh, the COO's behavior towards him. On account of the constructive dismissal, Mr. Matthews is awarded a notice period of 15 months. Now, this is where it gets interesting. 13 months following the constructive dismissal, Ocean Nutrition was sold for over $540 million. And this was a realizing event that triggered his right to payments under the long-term incentive plan and he would have been entitled to about $1.1 million. So this slide and the next slide are excerpts from the, uh, the ELTA provision, again, the long-term incentive plan provision. Okay, and if you read them, you'll see that again, the intention of the company is to say, look, um, you know, once the uh, once the employee is terminated, that's it. They're not going to be entitled um, to any any further uh, ELTA. Okay, and here's the second part of the of the clause. Okay, so the Supreme Court of Canada goes through the two part test. So for the first part, the the Supreme Court says we agree there was no question that the ELTA was an integral part of Mr. Battiston's or sorry, Mr. Matthews' compensation, okay? Um, but, the, but the second part of the test 
uh, the court finds that the LTIP provision uh, to exclude payment of LTIP amounts following termination did not unambiguously remove Mr. Matthews' right to compensation. So the Supreme Court of Canada has said what actually, despite the language that we just saw on the previous two slides, uh, we are not satisfied that uh, Mr. Matthews' right to this LTIP was unambiguously removed. And one reason that the Supreme Court gave was that the provision stated that it was of no force and effect if the employee ceases to be an employee of ONC. But then the court says, okay, but had he not been constructively dismissed, um, you know, he still would have been employed. And, uh, you know, the employment contract was not, would not be considered terminated until the notice period expires. So as a result, Mr. Matthews is entitled to the LTIP compensation, okay? So these cases are very important for employers because despite an employer's intention uh, to essentially deprive an employee of their bonus or LTIP entitlement, uh, these are two examples of cases where the courts are siding with the employee. So what can we do about this as an employer? So first of all, make sure provisions in employment contracts designed to limit an employee's entitlement to bonuses during the notice period are unambiguous. So as we've seen in the cases, language or phrases such as when ceases to be an employee, actively employed, employed full time, these phrases aren't good enough. Um, they cause confusion and uh, they don't seem to be getting em employers the results that they want. So a better strategy would be to explicitly state that the bonus or the LTIP or whatever it is, or any payment in lieu of that bonus or LTIP or whatever it is, will not be payable during any notice period to which the employee may be entitled in the event of termination without cause, okay? And for employers who are, are seeking essentially to deprive employees of these sorts of entitlements, we can do everything we can in the drafting stage. So certainly I would suggest getting legal advice about that. But given the way the law is going these days, you also just have to be aware of the risk that your language will ultimately not be enforceable and, and you may need to pay. And then as we've seen from the cases in, in particular at uh, Battiston, uh, it's very important to draw these sorts of clauses to the employee's attention before the agreement is signed so the employee now can't argue that it was onerous and I didn't read it and uh, I would, you know, I didn't understand it, right? So things such as bolded text, having the employee initial next to that clause, verbally explaining to the employee that, by the way, this is how the bonus plan works and to be very, very clear, um, you know, anything that is unvested as of, you know, your termination date for any reason will not be paid. You know, verbally explain to the employee what the intention is. Always helpful if the employee gets independent legal advice prior to signing the contract. And finally, uh, one of the problems in Battiston was, was that the bonus uh, plan was essentially dealt with by way of a click wrap agreement. So I would suggest avoid avoiding lengthy click wrap agreements where possible to avoid a similar problem that the employer had in that case. All right, and now we are on our fourth and final topic. And this is uh, a topic about whether employers are obligated to continue benefit plan contributions to an employee who was off work due to disability. And this issue actually uh, comes up a lot. And, uh, but nevertheless, I, I think this is a topic that, uh, that, that has not uh, been discussed enough uh, generally in the uh, employment world. Uh, so we'll talk about it today. So here's a quick overview of, uh, of the presentation for you. All right, so we'll start by looking at uh, the case of City of Toronto and uh, QP. So the griever, the employee, was hired as a full-time caseworker. And unfortunately, eight years later, he develops a disability, which requires him to work fewer days per week. 
Initially, the employer accommodates the employee by allowing him to remain in the full-time bargaining unit with access to the full-time employee benefit plan. So essentially, the benefit plan for full-time employees uh, was more comprehensive and provided better coverage than the part-time benefit plan, despite a reduction of, of the number of days that he was working per week. So 17 years later, uh, the collective agreement expires and the employer says, you know what, you know, we've been we've been nice to you for a long time, but, you know, sorry, this practice is going to end. So the result is that the griever gets placed into the part time bargaining unit because he's working a part time work week and he now ends up with the less attractive benefits package. Before we get into uh, the human rights code and, and what the what the court considered there. I just want to, to draw your attention to Section 51 of the Employment Standards Act. Any employee who is on a, a job protected leave under the Employment Standards Act would be entitled um, would be entitled to have the employer continue to pay any benefit plan contributions. Okay, so if you have a benefit plan which is in part paid for by the employer and in part paid for by the employee, and you have an employee who is now on an ESA approved leave, uh, the employer would be required to pay their portion of the benefit plan, but the employee would also be required to continue theirs, okay? Anyway, so if an employee is on an ESA approved leave, then the employer does have to continue the, the benefit plan contributions, okay? And, and these are uh, the, the list of ESA leaves, okay? But back to the QP case, the QP case uh, did not involve an employee who was on an ESA leave, okay? So, so that, that analysis doesn't really apply here, okay? So the court considered whether or not the employer had had acted in a discriminatory way and uh, the court concluded that employers are not obligated to continue full-time benefit contributions to an employee who was working part-time due to disability that employment benefits are paid as compensation for work and if an employee does only work part-time whether due to a disability or otherwise they are not entitled to the added benefits that full-time employees enjoy. And this is not going to be considered discriminatory treatment. The duty to accommodate disabled employees was not breached. And further, uh, the court found that the difference in treatment with respect to compensation, which includes benefits, was because of the number of hours worked and not because of the disability. And the duty to accommodate is not to completely alter the essence of the contract of employment, that is the employee's duty to perform work in exchange for remuneration. Okay. Now, to be very clear, QP was decided in the unionized context. Okay, there's another case called Ontario Nurses Association, a 1999 Court of Appeal, uh, which comes to uh, essentially the same conclusion. Um, this case does interpret provisions of the Human Rights Code. So just to be clear to everyone, uh, the reasoning does apply in both uh, the employment law world and the labor law world. So in both the unionized and uh, the non-unionized world, uh, the case would have some application. Okay. And I just want to look at uh, an excerpt from the, uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policy. It's called the Policy and Guidelines on Disability and the Duty to Accommodate. So the OHRC says that compensation to employees takes on different forms, such as contributions to benefit premiums or accrual of vacation credits, where employers, as a matter of course, pay a certain form of compensation to other employees who are absent from work. Employees absent due to disability are also entitled to such compensation. And this policy, I, I think, is, is quite consistent with the decision in, in uh, QP. Let's say we now have an employee who is off work on an extended uh, medical leave. And we also have an employee who was off for two years because uh, 
they have they want to travel the world and their employer agreed to give them an unpaid leave okay if neither employee um is entitled um you know to any benefits or any compensation okay the OHRC or OHRC is saying that's not discriminatory okay so I, I would say that uh, the decision is in fact consistent with this uh, OHRC policy and as a takeaway here a reminder that employers have a duty to accommodate employees with a disability providing employees with with a disability full-time benefits is not required and this last point is what we often see. If an employer chooses to provide benefits beyond the legal requirements, it is advisable to clearly specify at the outset how long such voluntary benefits will continue. So often if an employee is on an extended medical leave and, and wants to, to stay on the benefit plan, often the employer will say, look, not a problem, you can stay on the benefits plan, but look, you now have to pay both the employer and the employee contribution to the plan. Um, so here's how much it's going to be. So send us your monthly checks. If that's the approach that you're going to take as an employer, um, in, unless you are clear that you want this arrangement to potentially go on forever, and you probably don't, um, you may want to make it clear um, in terms of how long this arrangement is going to continue, or at least say that, you know, we're going to commit to doing this, you know, for two years. So keeping you as an employee on the benefit plan with you paying, with the employee paying the premiums. And then, you know, shortly before the two year mark ends, then we're going to have a discussion and we're going to continue how to go on from there. Okay, so just have some discussions with employees, reduce everything to writing. Uh, to avoid to avoid uh, uncertainty and, and potential legal disputes down the road. Okay, so that concludes um, all of our presentations for today. Okay, we are going to take a break uh, for 15 minutes, so it's about 10:30. Uh, we'll come back at uh, at 10:45, and I will do the uh, the Q and A period. So. Um, at the last break, I see that there already have been some questions submitted. Thank you for those. Uh, for those of you who may have questions and haven't already submitted them, please feel free to submit them now. And I will review them over the break. And then I will come back on at quarter to 11 and will answer as many of your questions as possible. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you very shortly at 1045.
Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for staying with us uh, this morning, uh, all the way until the end, and for submitting your questions. I'm going to answer uh, as many of the questions now as I can, and then we will wrap things up so you can all get on with your days. Okay. Okay. The first question we had was about uh, common law damages for uh, for wrongful dismissal in the in the COVID-19 era and have we gotten any sense of whether whether the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is going to affect the damages that employees are getting awarded um, now that we're in the pandemic and I'm not aware uh, of any specific uh, damages wrongful dismissal damages decisions that we have gotten out yet um, I, I do know that uh, that in the past uh, the courts have been asked before to address issues of, of whether uh, you know poor economies how how a poor economy or what impact a poor economy should have on an employee severance package. And uh, on the one hand, you'll have employees saying, you know, look, I just got fired from my job and the economy's bad and there's nothing out there. So I should be entitled to a longer common law notice period. Whereas the employer is going to say, well, you know, the reason why we had to lay off employees in the first place was because the economy is bad and we need to remain viable as a business. So in fact, the notice period should be shorter. So I, I, I think there is a parallel between that situation and the, the current situation. And not surprisingly, I would say it really depends on the judge that you get. There are some judges who are more employee friendly, who will take the employee side and say, well, it's too hard for this employee to find a job. So I'm going to award a notice period on the higher end of the range. And then you have judges who are more employer friendly, who whose sympathies lie with the employers, and and the answer there will be, well, you know, the employer only did it for economic reasons; they need to remain viable, so it should be a lower notice period. So the short answer to this question is, we don't know yet, and it probably depends on the judge that you get. The next question was about uh, workplace uh, stress rules under the WSIB and, and what the interplay would be between that and I believe the, the Occupational Health and Safety Act decision about stress that I, I discussed in the COVID-19 portion of the presentation. So, so there, there, there have been WSIB decisions uh, which, which make it clear that uh, that if stress is caused, if, if, an, if an employee, you know, has stress or anxiety and, and, and that can be shown to be linked to, uh, to something that happened in the workplace, uh, there could be a WSIB claim available to that employee for that. Um, the difference I think here though, is that the, the decision that we're, that we're talking about, that was an occupational health and safety decision. And the only issue there uh, was whether or not uh, there was a workplace hazard or whether the the employer was providing a safe workplace um, and, and the, the WSIB issue um, you know was not relevant in that case and that decision in fact predates some of the amendments to the workplace uh, to, to the WSIB legislation um, but, uh, but thank you that was that's a good point. Uh, the next qu question we had was related to the recommendation to update employment contracts annually and you know how to go about doing that and uh, the point was made that well you probably can't just do that unilaterally as an employer and you're right no you can't do it unilaterally as an employer uh, what most employers do is when they are when they are giving their employees uh, their their annual raises um often uh, that would be a good time to amend the contract so if we have an employee um who was getting a raise and you know we now have a decision like waxdale that that just came out and the employer needs to amend their termination for just cause language uh, 
uh, it would be a good opportunity uh, for the employer to say, okay, here's your new contract, you know, for 2021, which includes your raise. And, you know, there's some other terms that, uh, that are amended as well. So read everything carefully. And one of them could be uh, the termination for just cause language. Uh, the next question was about was about infectious disease emergency leave and uh, when that is is going to end. Um, the the deemed infectious disease emergency leave, meaning that if an employer um, has reduced an employee's uh, salary or, or work hours due to COVID nineteen, and the employee is deemed to be placed on infectious disease emergency leave. Uh, the answer to that would be uh, early January of 2020. I believe it's January 2nd or with, within a day or two of that in 2020. Um, in terms of employees who are not deemed to be on that leave, but in fact would like to be on that leave because they have childcare obligations um, at home, um, there, there is no end date that has been specified to that leave. Um, the only infectious disease that I'm aware of that qualifies for the leave right now is COVID-19. Uh, so as long as the employee meets the criteria for that leave, uh, they would continue to be eligible. And uh, child care is one of the, the reasons that would make them eligible. Uh, we, we get into a bit of a gray area in terms of whether or not you know, the child is going to virtual school or, you know, school at home. Um, so if there's a specific uh, situation uh, that you're thinking of uh, to the person who asked that question, I'd be happy to uh, discuss that with you in more detail. Um, but for the non-deemed infectious disease emergency leave, um, it, it continues uh, to be in place and uh, the government has not announced an end date for that leave. Uh, the next question was about... Uh, about a termination slash resignation. So the scenario was that an employee gave four weeks notice of their resignation and the employer decided to fire the employee earlier or didn't want the employee to stay for four weeks. And you know how would that play out? Uh, my first comment would be um, if there is anything in the employment contract uh, in the termination or resignation section, uh, which explains how that might play out, um, that's a good place to start. Uh, but if not, if an employee has given an employer a, a certain resignation period, so four weeks, and the employer says, well, actually, you know what, I want you out now or I, I want you out after two weeks, um, then then likely uh, the employer will need to pay uh, the employee until the end of the resignation period. It's also going to depend again on what the, the termination or resignation provisions say in the contract and uh, how long the employee has worked for that employer. So if there's a specific situation and if you need specific legal advice about that situation, please get in touch with me and, and you can give me some more details about that. The next question we had was about a, a seasonal employee who has been off work for some time um, and has not been able to uh, return to work uh, because the work has not been available um, for COVID-19 reasons. And, and the question was, well, what are the employer's options in terms of dealing with that employee? Uh, well, I mean, there is there there are, are a few. Um, I mean, one option would be to terminate the employee and provide a severance package. Um, you know, the other the other option would be to speak to the employee and you know see if the employee is interested in you know some sort of some sort of unpaid leave agreement. Um, the other issue to consider. Um, is under the Employment Standards Act. I mean, if the reason this employee is not working now was because of COVID-19, under the Employment Standards Act, uh, the employee likely would be considered to be on a deemed infectious disease emergency leave, which is essentially uh, an unpaid job protected leave. Um, there are some issues with, uh, with how the common law, uh, what the common law interplay would be. Um, but anyway, that option would be for the employer to take the position uh, 
um, that the employee is simply on an unpaid leave of absence as per the ESA and you know will be recalled back to work uh, when it's the right season and when COVID-19 is not an issue anymore. Uh, if there's a specific question uh, that you would like to address with me, uh, please give me a call and I'd be happy to uh, provide some specific legal advice about the specific situation. The next question we had was about an employee who has been on uh, medical leave for some time and every few weeks the employee was providing some some vague medical notes saying that uh, that they were unable to work and as I understand it the most recent note was that it was the leave was going to be for an indefinite period of time and there there was no there, there was no real knowledge or, or reasonable predictions of when the employee might come back to work. So when I hear facts like these, I mean, the first question that would pop into my mind is, okay, you know, at what point uh, would this employment contract be frustrated? So in other words, um, you know, can, can we make a case as an employer that this employee will not be able to perform the basic duties of their job within the reasonably foreseeable future. Uh, now the considerations uh, for an employer who wants to allege frustration of contract, so first keep in mind that if the employer is the one alleging that, the burden of proof would be on the employer. Um, and if you lose, if you, if you argue frustration and you're wrong, then you're gonna get hit with the discrimination claim probably. Uh, based on disability. Um, if the employer is right that the employment contract was frustrated, it would mean that neither the employer nor the employee would have any further obligations under the contract, but the employee would still be entitled to their minimum entitlements under the Employment Standards Act. And I would also just note that frustration of contract is going to depend on a number of factors, including the years of service of the employee, uh, the job that they hold, and you know what the medical notes actually say. So um, to the person who asked me this question, if you would like to reach out and provide me with some additional information, I would be happy to give you some specific legal advice about this scenario. And the final question uh, that came in uh, is about, um, extension so we have a scenario where the employer terminated an employee and made a severance offer to the employee and wanted the employee to to sign the offer back to indicate their acceptance relatively quickly to indicate their agreement and the question was about you know asking for extensions um, absolutely uh, the employee can certainly ask the employer for an extension um, in my view, it's, uh, it's, it's usually better for everyone if both the employer and the employee are getting legal advice um, prior to the signing of these severance agreements to ensure that everyone uh, understands everything. Um, I, I can say that, uh, you know, if, if the employer refuses the extension and the employee doesn't sign, and, um, you know, the, the worst thing that could happen, I guess, from the employee's perspective is that the employer would withdraw the offer. Um, but uh, but I, I, I don't think I've ever seen uh, an employer do that um, in my 10 years of practice. So anyway, the short answer is yes, you can absolutely ask for an extension. And I would encourage you to get legal advice before you sign. Okay, so that is all the questions. Um, thank you all once again for coming. Um, another reminder that uh, the slides will be available. Uh, they will be posted to our firm's website shortly. If you'd like and you want them even more quickly than that, you can email me and I would be happy to, to send you a copy of the slides directly to you. Okay. Um, the next seminar that we will likely be hosting is, is probably going to be in, in February or March. We usually do three to four of these seminars uh, per year. Uh, so when we have the uh, when we have the date set for the next seminar, uh, we will let you know. Uh, once again, thank you all very much for attending and staying uh, till the very very end. And uh, have a great day. Thanks very much.